Travis Wayne Goodsell. As I've uh, done and talked about in my videos, I'll often have uh, some kind of coating for you, depending on the video, whether that's uh, coded speech, whether that's code in the background, or in this particular video, I'll try to put the code right here. It's going to be a little tough because I've got skin mixed with the blue shirt. So we'll, we'll see. Maybe I'll put it up put it up here in the dark area or maybe I'll put it up here uh, and make the font black. We'll see. Uh, but uh, uh, we're going to teach you more about Paleo Hebrew. Isn't that exciting? So many of my viewers love Paleo Hebrew. That is my number one seller of books, by the way. Even more than the church uh, exposure of crime and lies. But uh, uh, it does very poorly on YouTube. <laughs> the church is the big one on YouTube. And so we can bring in the church. Nelson and uh, the October conference last year uh, talked about Israel as he consulted with two Hebrew scholars to uh, learn the white supremacist uh, definition, let God prevail. That's completely wrong. And we're going to go over that today. Because Jacob is uh, the twin son of uh, Isaac and Rebecca. I always get Rachel and Rebecca mixed up. And uh, Isaac, if you don't know, is uh, the one who uh, took over the birthright blessing from uh, uh, Ishmael as uh, Hagoth, Hagar, I don't remember her name, uh, I'm not going to look it up, it's not germane to the video at this time, uh, was uh, ordered to leave the family by uh, Sarah, who was Sarai originally, Abram turned into Abraham. And so, uh, this is the Jewish version of it. Because uh, Islam all claim authority back to Ishmael instead of Jacob. And Esau was the twin brother who came out of the womb first. Esau means hairy, because he was hairy as a baby, I guess. And uh, Jacob held on to his ankle, sort of like that Achilles heel. <laughs> and yes, uh, the Achilles comes from uh, the original source for all of this. As uh, uh, Jacob was therefore named Jacob because he was trying to usurp the birthright blessing by coming out of the womb first, but came out second. And the name is specifically chosen by the author for the purposes of coding. The author of Genesis, in most cases, defines the name by talking about an event that occurs in connection to the name. That is important to understand before we begin this, because this is what I'm doing, is I'm revealing code to you through Paleo Hebrew. <coughs> and as uh, it was time for uh, the passing of the birthright and the blessing, as Isaac is portrayed as being old, 
senile and blind. Notice Samson was also blinded as he took down the Philistines. We'll get to that. Uh, uh, Rebecca counsels Jacob to go sell the brother's birthright for pottage. Now the original text from which it comes from it was a salad with special sauce and I won't get into the Egyptian version of it but uh, uh, Esau you know does he sells his birthright for the pottage and then uh, the blessing is involved and the blessing Uh, Rebecca again tells Jacob to put on an animal skin that's hairy to fool ja uh, is Isaac to give Jacob the blessing instead of Esau. And afterwards he claims, oh, I knew all along. <laughs> you didn't fool me. And probably correct, because brothers often behave differently. Uh, especially... Uh, in this particular case, as Jacob is the one at home with mom, and Esau is out in the field. <laughs> so clearly there's a distinction of duties and responsibilities in the household that would have distinguished the two uh, for the father. But nonetheless, that's the way the story was written. <coughs> and... Uh, and so, when Esau finds out that his, his blessing had also been stolen from him, he then says, you were rightly named. Ta-da! Thus we get the reason why the names. And, uh, you then have, uh, I'm thinking of the order I should do this in, uh, You have the Lord eventually coming to Jacob and saying, okay, you've uh, successfully done this, you will now be called Israel. And no, it's not let God prevail. Jacob prevailed, not God. And so what happens is instead of Esau being the source of for the descendant who is to be the Messiah in this particular case the story is all about Moses <clears throat> five books of Moses it's all leading up to Moses and so Esau is rejected as being that lineage for the future Moses. It's now going to be through Jacob, who's now new named as Israel. Now I've gone over this with you, it's not let God prevail. There is God with the L, but Israel, it could be one word name but nobody knows it and that's why those Hebrew scholars said uh, let God prevail is one possible yeah they don't know they don't know Paleo Hebrew it's okay so here's where we're, we're gonna put the first thing one way or the other the why and if I were to say Yod you would understand it in Semitic terms. It's not Semitic we're talking about here. Uh, my research in Paleo-Hebrew is that it's more connected to Paleo-Greek, as they share the exact same characters, and thus to different characters in Egyptian. 
William Foxwell Albright's uh, decipherment of proto-cyanetic demonstrated that it was Semitic and then claimed that therefore it is the older text of what has become Paleo-Hebrew and then Hebrew and so forth, so forth. This is all wrong. It actually destroys the dating because uh, it requires Assyria to have come in and conquered the area which was not done until after Babylon therefore even though they're talking about Egyptian Hathor and the cave inscription that they're, he's referring to for this uh, it's much younger it's not as old as everybody's claiming it is and so yes I know there's a guy who who transliterated the Hebrew Bible into uh, proto cyanetic and it's cool for that purpose in and of itself but it can't be taken as a source document that needs to be understood so instead what we have for Israel and again I'm the foremost I'm the only one who's deciphered Paleo-Hebrew so I am the foremost expert on all things Paleo-Hebrew <coughs> and so you're getting exclusive information if you've not heard it in my other videos the Y or what's Israel so it's I is a correspondent to the Greek letter Zeta that's what it is in Paleo-Hebrew is a Z shape and whether or not it should be pronounced as a Z, uh, it doesn't really much matter for this video. Because we're going off of the shapes. This is how I deciphered Paleo-Hebrew. This is the word that is used for the Hebrew God as pronounced Yah. I'm should I have to wait? <laughs> I can adjust the time, so I'm okay. <coughs> and Yah, pictorially, which is a picture match, for the Greek god. Oh, isn't that interesting? Zeus. The us, or us, at the end, is the masculine singular form that's added into Greek. Paleo-Hebrew doesn't have anything. Or so it is. There is scant records in Paleo-Hebrew, thus it's unclear, but Greek, tons of stuff. So, uh, But uh, Proto or uh, Canaanite is often referred to as the origin for both Paleo-Greek and Paleo-Hebrew. I just call it Paleo-Hebrew. And, uh, and so the, the gods have the same name. They just have different activities in the different lands where they are. And uh, so Eva Vasilevska, who uh, is a anthropology of the ancient Middle East, uh, who I'm not sure if she's still teaching at the University of Utah, uh, but uh, I hope so. Uh, she's excellent. She was the only woman and American to be allowed to do archaeology in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. And he made sure to give her his guards to protect her and her site. And uh, she's the one who discovered, as she published it in her book, uh, a scene containing both Yah and Baal which is a Canaanite deity uh, together uh, I think they were brothers 
uh, in anthropomorphic form, human form. So yes, they had dick pics, <laughs> identifying them as males. And uh, and so uh, Yah is the same as Zeus, but because of the different lands, different identifications. And so that's the I part of Israel, is Yah, the Hebrew God. If you're unfamiliar with Elijah, that's God, El, Yah, the Hebrew God, Yah, Zeus. And so Elijah is the God, Yah, which has significance if I were to be talking about Joseph Smith in the Doctrine and Covenant section 110, where he sees Elijah and Moses on Passover in the Kirtland Temple. Because again, we're not Christian. We're the learning of the pre-captivity Jews, Israelite, Egyptians. This needs to be understood. And so what you have with Ra is uh, just the letter. The vowels need to be re removed from the text. And, and so the S and the R is the word for prince. And then you have L for God. The Yah, the I symbol, or the I letter at the beginning, is used as a prefix determinative for prince. This is what I discovered in the decipherment of Paleo-Hebrew's vocabulary, is that they utilize prefix determinatives, which before the word, there are two-letter words, not three-letter words in Semitic. And the third letter is added before. Now when I get to Samson, Samson has the word son and then an N at the end. I don't want to ruin it for you, but that's a suffix determinative in that particular case. And so L is actually a suffix determinative here. Uh, because uh, if you understand the ancient culture, uh, you understand that God is not understood as Christians understand God. This is what people do not understand about North Korea, as Kim Jong-un is perceived as God to Koreans, the North Koreans. And Christians make fun of him and laugh. Ah, oh, he's no God, he bleeds. It's not the original meaning. You can't impose Christianity upon the ancients, and yet they've done it. <clears throat> so what you have is Yah, who is the Prince of God. And as Prince, he then is the heir to the throne of the King. And so you see that Jacob is made the heir to the throne. He usurped the birthright and the blessing and was named accordingly. And his line was now going to have Moses, the Messiah, to save Israel from the Egyptians. Now this was written during the Roman period. The oldest version of it we have is from the Essenes and uh, the time is uh, 
about 100 BC to 100 AD, somewhere around there. And uh, the Qumran community. That is the oldest version we have. And so if you've heard about the documentary hypothesis, it needs to be dismissed, it's wrong. <coughs> the uh, zeitgeist uh, generation of scholarship uh, was uh, pushing a what never became a new theory but they were on track to do so. I am the last remaining scholar to have actually done so and uh, corrected both of their informations. And uh, Gary Greenberg, who did the 101 Myths of the Bible, and uh, the famous D.M. Murdoch, who were the two promoters. Uh, as uh, D.M. Murdoch was the foremost popular one involved, and is quoted in the Zeitgeist movie. Uh, she focused on the New Testament, though, uh, though she did do one book about uh, Moses, and then Gary Greenberg, in his 101 Myths, tries to recognize uh, without referencing and without making the connection the identification to Egyptian picture glyphs. So yes, I am the foremost expert on Egyptian picture glyphs because I'm the one who deciphered them. Uh, Gary Greenberg and uh, D.M. Murdoch identified that the stories were coming from translations of the picture glyphs, but it's me who developed it into a theory and deciphered the picture glyphs. And, uh, uh, and so Egyptologists, they're not part of the zeitgeist movement. They don't know this. And so if you have access to uh, Gardner's sign list, which you can access on Wikipedia, they have Gardner's sign list for you, uh, you, can, you can do your own check. Go through the different facsimiles and see if you can identify all of the characters from the sign list. And I can guarantee you, you're not going to find them all. In fact, you're not going to find most. And there's a difference between the text and those hieroglyphic characters and the characters, the hieroglyphic characters, in the actual pictures next to the text. And it's easily identifiable and distinguishable and yet, without fail, I get somebody who doesn't know anything about Egyptian other than what he hears and sees and doesn't catch on and thinks he can put a hate comment that I don't know what I'm talking about. So, nonetheless, uh, that's the situation with that. And so, uh, when you look, therefore, at facsimile number three, we're going to stray here a little bit, just a little bit. It's not a full stray, it's it's still related. Facsimile number three, I'm the one who's translated facsimile number three, the picture glyphs. Yes, Michael Rhodes has a translation of the, uh, the text as does Wikipedia, also show uh, other Egyptologists, I'm not sure if there's two or one other than Michael Rhodes, but uh, yeah, they do a comparison with what Joseph Smith said and what Michael Rhodes said and other, at least one or two others. <coughs> uh, they don't understand how to translate petroglyphs. That's why they don't understand that Joseph Smith is actually right on. Because Abraham is Pharaoh. Not the woman Pharaoh behind him. This is crucial in understanding the 
dating of the scene, even though the dating is like 300 BC to 300 AD in that time period, as apologists are trying to say, oh, oh, it's from uh, Pharaoh uh, Shishak. And they get that from facsimile number two, which the name of the deceased is Shishank or Shishank or something like that. <coughs> and they're wrong. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it's always good to go to an expert rather than to a speculator. And so what you have with facsimile number three is Joseph claiming that the person on the throne is Abraham, and he could just as easily put Isaac, or Jacob, or Joseph, or Moses. Any number of people could have been put into this position. This is how picture glyphs work in translation. Joseph Smith chose Abraham to be the Pharaoh on the throne. So it's important to understand in facsimile number one, figure number 10's explanation, Abraham in Egypt, that we're not talking about Ur of Babylon Chaldees or Chaldeans. I think Joseph Smith slightly alters the word. We may need to refer to the 1769 King James Version but uh, regardless, doesn't matter. Joseph clearly indicates Egypt is the land we're referring to here. And so, who's the prince then? Even though Joseph Smith or the printer made an error, or the scribe made an error in switching the prince and the waiter, oops, yeah, you switch them, The prince is the one being presented before Pharaoh. Father, the king. Who then would the prince be? Isaac. And so if you're concerned about, well, Travis, you didn't explain who the female Pharaoh is. There are a limited number of female Pharaohs in Egyptian history. <laughs> there's one in the Old Kingdom, there's one in the 18th Dynasty of the David Moses Dynasty, <laughs> and then Cleopatra is another famous one as well. And so, yeah, I gave you some big clues there, didn't I? <clears throat> and so, uh, this is the coronation of Isaac. Ta-da! And yes, it can be translated other ways as well. As a judgment scene for anybody who goes through the temple to be washed as a high priest and anointed as a king and Christ to be Pharaoh on the throne. Yes, that's our origin religion, Mormons. It's not Jesus Christ during the Roman period. That is not the religion we're restoring. We're not Christian. And I've gone over why Jesus is not correct and is instead another prophecy scripture for the latter day Messiah. After uh, the full usurpation of the birthright and blessing, Esau then seeks comfort in a Philistine woman, or a Canaanite woman, and uh, uh, her name is Judith. Judith is the female form in the Egyptian, uh, though there was a group of Masoretes when working on the scripture uh, utilize that ending as the singular feminine form as other uh, another group used uh, the H 
as the uh, singular feminine form. And so you have to be careful when you're going over the Bible as to which uh, Masoretic group you are, you are reviewing. Uh, but uh, uh, Judah is the root word here. And so with Judah, man, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be able to get this done for you today because I gotta go back over this, and I've gotta take off today. <laughs> Judah has the I for Yah and then Hood. In Paleo Hebrew, there's the H, which is the flail. If you're familiar with King Tut, he uh, has the, the flail and the uh, shepherd's crook in his arms as he crosses them. Well, that's the Aramaic letter for A, the Aleph. <coughs> that's why they're not the same as Paleo Hebrew, but the flail is what's used to uh, swat flies, swat the flies off of your animal, as well as whip it to get it to move. So when you look at facsimile number two, uh, the scene that's upside down with the the uh, the bull or ox with the man behind it with the one eye of Ra or uh, Horus or the Wajidai. Uh, you can uh, uh, see that he's got a little flail thing in his hand. That's H, and it symbolizes air. And as with air, thus spirit, as understood by the ancients. Because you can't see the spirit, and so they just describe it in terms of air. And uh, they have a name for it. They have multiple names for different forms of it, variations of it. Uh, but the general one is air, spirit. And so then you have the D, delta. And with delta, you have a pyramid. Simple enough. And uh, that corresponds... I didn't tell you about yod and what yod corresponds with. You need to do that. Uh, the pyramids were the primordial mound that rose up between the two waters in the creation story and likewise with the Egyptian creation story so that's what that refers to the spirit of the primordial mound which is the birthright blessing sun all tied in together into one symbol but translatable many different ways depending on what you want spoken and so it corresponds with the inundation of the Nile flood, creation of heaven and earth, creation of babies with the birthright blessing sun, and more as well. And so uh, that's uh, HUD, is that it refers to Yah as the God and the spirit of the firstborn birthright blessing primordial mountain sun. That's Judah. That's the meaning of his name. And in that sense, he is to be the one who King David is to come through as a result. And uh, so, Yah. You've got the Z shape. The line on top is the uh, linear uh, meaning heaven. Line on the bottom, earth. Line in the middle, that's air. That comes from the creation glyph, Heliopolis creation glyph of the Egyptians. 
So Yah, as I'm the one who deciphered Paleo-Hebrew, I'm the one who deciphered the Paleo-Hebrew vocabulary, therefore I applied it in translation to the text of the Hebrew Bible, as Joseph Smith said that in his King Follett discourse, the Hebrew Bible is translated incorrectly, and he talked to Joshua Sykes, who said, uh, it would ruin the Bible if you were to translate Elohim correctly because the Masoretes purposely messed it all up and uh, and so by following Joseph Smith taking his translation and carrying it through to the rest of the chapter as I've I, I've gone not sure how far I got if it was to Noah's flood or I'm not sure how far but uh, it was just a preliminary translation because I still needed to finish the vocabulary first so that I can then justify the translation uh, but uh, uh, Yah is the God referred to in the corrected translation of the Hebrew Bible not Elohim. Elohim is to be translated in the plural. And it even describes it in the text when correctly translated. And uh, and so that's the God. Now, you may know it becomes Yahweh or Jehovah incorrectly pronunciated Sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. And everybody's confused about this. And think that, oh, well, there are two different source documents that were merged together into one. No, I've already done the video for you. As I've demonstrated, they're from the exact same Heliopolis creation glyph. As you have... Uh, Tefnut uh, being the moisture that waters the ground, and then Elohim, or not Elohim, Shu <laughs> blowing life into the finished molded project of man who is Adam, the soil, the earth, Geb. Yeah. And so there you have an explanation as to why heaven and earth are being referred to as humans. These are the generations of heaven and earth. And we don't get to the generations of heaven and earth until after they're then detailed in creation in chapter 2. Uh, and then you have the garden scene with that brass serpent and uh, then you get into the genealogy as they give birth to Cain and Abel and talk about how Jesus is murdered by his brother Set, Satan, who becomes King Satan, or Set as King Set as Satan. And I've gone over that with you as well. This is all Paleo Hebrew stuff. So this is this is a, a video that uh, you are receiving extra information that you will not get anywhere else because of my knowledge and expertise in the area. And so those of you who think you're going to say, deny, yeah, screw you. You don't have to watch. Go away. That's all you have to do. Just go away if you do not believe. But nope, nope. they got to be bullies. And they got to show that they know better than me by not knowing anything about the subject matter anyway. <laughs> this is dumb. Just go away. So anyway, back on track. Jacob is uh, forced to marry two women. There's a reason for that, as it's a pattern. But uh, the first wife, Leah, uh, has uh, Reuben, then Simeon, then Judah. The same name that Esau married 
of the Philistine Canaanites, Judith. And this is the key child, as the author has to then try to explain that Reuben wanted nothing to do with the birthright, gave it up, and uh, Simeon was a bad, bad boy, lost the right and privilege. So thus it falls to Judah uh, to be the birthright blessing son through Leah. Now remember, Joseph is the favored birthright blessing son. As the story says, he has the, uh, the extra long sleeve coat, not the colored coat, that's the Septuagint version. And then you get Donny Osmond doing the many glowing light thing. Ugh. I've never seen it, never want to. Just knowing that Donny Osmond's involved scares me away. <laughs> but nonetheless, Judah is the name. I went over the name. It's because Judah is going to be the one through whom King David is to be born. Even though it's supposed to be about Moses, but Moses is instead a type and shadow, as the Book of Mormon calls it, for the King David. Now we're already in the King David dynasty. It's because we're talking about a future King David who is to restore the throne. And so Jesus failed, it's not him to spoil it for him. And so thus Judah is one such person. But notice Ezekiel says, hey, he's actually through Ephraim, but also through Judah, and the two will be merged together as he will be like Moses to gather as well as save Judah and Israel latter days. But this is where Judah comes in. Now in chapter 38, uh, Judah marries a daughter of the Canaanites, just as Esau married a Canaanite woman who was named Judith. And this is a different woman than the one who, according to the laws, needed to be married as she cannot be a single mother the family of which she had married into all the men died <laughs> and were not able to give her uh, seed a child as a result so that's the forbidden chapter in the Bible where she sees Judah and is inspired by God to pretend to be a Canaanite prostitute, which didn't exist. It's a an anthropo uh, not anthropomorphic anachronism uh, for when it was written during the Roman period, which had sacral prostitutes. That's how we know it's an anachronism. But uh, they're trying to tell us a coded story here. And her name, this other woman, the Canaanite that he marries, is named Shua. It's got the water symbol S. And uh, the sun symbol. In the creation understanding, that I've talked about, waters are separated, dry land appears. The dry land is the firstborn birthright blessing son. In the Egyptian understanding, you have uh, kefir in the morning. Yeah. Am I pronouncing that right? Uh, as a baby. At noon, 
he's Amun. All Mormons or former Mormons, ex-Mormons, know Amun. Son Amun, as referred to by Joseph Smith in the Doctrine and Covenants. This is Emmanuel, the God Amun. El, God, Amun, the noonday son of the Egyptians. He's the head God. He's way back before we have records. He's the big head honcho. He's the one everybody's waiting for. And so here you have the sun symbol, and Adam is the evening sun if you're interested. The ancient of days. But you have Amun, who is uh, in the name of the woman he's marrying. And you have the waters. And in picture understanding, to try to be as simple as I can with it, even though I'm probably over everybody's head already. <coughs> Long time ago, we're at 46 minutes already. You have uh, the sun that travels across the sky with the divided waters, the land and the heavens above. And this is what she was named for. She was to be the one through whom uh, the, the birthright blessing son is to be. Even though Tamara, uh, is it Tamara? Now I have to actually check. Because Tamara is another woman given to his son, Ur. Uh, now, we won't get into it then. Because it'll take time to find it. And, uh, but won't. I'm pretty sure it's 36? Uh, maybe? Well, I, I, like I said, I don't want to spend the time wasting more time trying to find it. Uh, I was just going to focus on this lineage through Judah. And so, what did they name their firstborn birthright blessing son? Ur. Not Ur of the Chaldeans. That's a different spelling. But you have R. Uh, well, you have waters, which is the prefix determinative, and just one letter word for the sun. And so, yes, she's technically nut, is who this is. And uh, uh, where you have Ur, their firstborn birthright blessing son, you have uh, the sun as the prefix determinative, and R is the uh, Egyptian symbol of a flag, which is understood in translation as God. So it's similar to El of the Canaanites. And so you have Sun God in a literal translation. And who's the sun god of the Egyptians? Amun. Who is the heir to the throne? Amun. So there you have Judah marrying Shua, giving birth to the sun god to be the heir. Could be after. I'd have to stop the video and then figure it out. But uh, this is the coding that's given to us in the uh, Bible when it's translated correctly. And yet we do not have prophets who are able to be translators 
as we have prophets who don't even want to be translators and prefer to be white supremacists instead. So, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I think this is, he, Judah does have, oh, this? Oh, it is. Oh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is the story. I was here all along. <laughs> I don't need to go searching. It's right here. Now I understand. So, Ur is uh, given to wife, and it's kind of worded here weird, funny. Uh, let's see. There is some Sheila. Him is. There is. Okay. Yeah. In verse 6, Judah took a wife. Now I'm sure it was the caveman days where you get the club, you bonk the woman on the head, drag them back to her the cave, right? I need to find out the source for that. Was it a comic strip? But anyway, uh, for her, his firstborn. Uh, whose name was Tamar. I knew there was I knew there was something weird about this. <laughs> and so he's given Tamar as his wife. So we do get to talk about this. So this is important. As remember, Ur is the firstborn birthright's blessing son, whose name is Sun God. You know, Israel Yah, Prince of God. There we go. We're doing the symbolism. They're naming their children as the fulfillment. But Ur was wicked. And uh, I'm not sure it's got Lord. I'm not sure if it's Yahweh. But uh, slew him. And Judah said to Onan, you need to give seed to your brother's wife and marry her um, and so Onan knew that the seed should not be his and it came to pass that he went in unto his brother's wife and he masturbated and uh, so that he was not able to uh, uh, have sex and so then uh, he was slain <laughs> and people make the mistake of assuming masturbation is a sin because of this. No, that's not what it's saying. Uh, then Judah, then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow at my house, at my at thy father's house. So get out of here. <laughs> Go back to your father. Uh, sons are all dead. Uh, until Shelah, my other son, uh, be grown. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Three sons. Two of them died. And uh, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto the sheep shearer to Timnath. He and his friend Hera and Adulamite, or the Adulamite, and uh, it was told Tamar, saying, "Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep." Uh, and so, you know, so she doesn't pursue Shalah, I guess. Uh, for she saw that. She, oh wait a minute, he does die. Okay, wait a minute, and she was not given unto him to wife. Okay, she put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. And she saw that Shelah was grown, 
and she was not given unto him to wife. Oh, yeah, Judah didn't want to give. Okay. Uh, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a sacral prostitute, not a harlot. I tried to get this changed with James Baker. Uh, the church refused. <laughs> they want to call her a harlot. But this is the lineage for King David and Moses with the 18th dynasty. And for the future, a uh, man like Moses in 103, verse 16. I turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. She had grown up and blossomed as a rose. Uh, and so, yeah, they have sex. And there you have it. Uh, she was following the law. She was supposed to be married to Shalah. Judah refused. So Judah now is responsible to make sure that she gets impregnated. And so there's no harlot thing being done here this was all part of the legal custom women were considered property and so there you have it uh, Tamar can't leave her out because we now got to get into uh, uh, Samuel deal with that program here in a second hi uh, Tamar has the word Mary, Mar, Mary, which in Egyptian is love. The T at the beginning is a prefix determinative, which is crossroads. It's considered two planks of wood for crossroads. Uh, you can call it the cross, but you'd be wrong in the sense of death because it refers to eternal life as the Egyptian Ankh. It's the Messiah uh, as one of his various symbols. Uh, technically, all of them are related to him. Uh, but uh, this one has to do with him being the one at the crossroads uh, between heaven and earth that is the mediator for mankind, etc. That's how it's supposed to be understood for eternal life. Alrighty, uh, technically I should stop and not go over uh, the Samson part, but I've pretty much already done it. I'm just going to do the, the word again. As uh, 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 Samson, Shemesh, his son, he got the two water S's, uh, and then the Messiah symbol of the high priest in the middle, the M. Uh, and thus, as the sun is between the sky, the heaven and the earth, uh, so too is the, the Messiah high priest symbol between the two waters. The waters were separated, dry land appeared, that's the Messiah symbol. So that's how sun is understood in Paleo-Hebrew. And it seems a little weird to have uh, a three-letter uh, word without a prefix determinative, but you could also use the first S as the prefix determinative uh, to clarify the Messiah of the sky, that it refers to the, the creation story concept. And so in that sense, it is still a two-letter word with a prefix determinative. And so the N at the end, if it's for a land, it represents kingdom, if it's for a person, it represents king. So Samson is the sun king. And I've gone over the video of how Samson the sun king is giving us in code the dates for the three days of darkness that are talked about with Moses and the Exodus, which is for the latter days of uh, uh, the solar eclipses is all three dates. 21st of August 2017, 14th or 24th, 
of October uh, 2023 and 8 April 2024. The Death Day. <laughs> That's how it was done. You have the solar eclipse in the lion constellation for the death of the lion that Samson slew. Then you have uh, the solar eclipse in Virgo, which is the woman, and so Samson, you know, Delilah, which comes from Lilith, which comes from Nut, the night sky goddess of heaven. Uh, in Alphabet Ben Sarah, she's the first wife of Adam. To explain chapter one from chapter two. Uh, and then you have uh, Samson dying, which is his death. So when you read the Book of Mormon and you hear this Samuel, name of God, God, or name of God, Sam, and Shem, which is name, and then El is God, name of God, the Lamanite, says, hey, there's going to be a birth sign and a death sign as Lehi, has a vision in his dream, seeing the heavens, so he's seen a sign, two signs in the heavens that are merged together into one. He sees the birth sign and the death sign, which come from Revelation, as Nephi in his dream is explained. Hey, I'm gonna explain this to this guy named John. Revelation. Well, the birth sign is in Revelation chapter 12. And this is what Isaiah is referring to. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. He's not talking about an actual physical birth and conception of birth. He's talking about a sign. Matthew leaves out sign when he tries to explain that it's a real event that's happening during the Roman period. Who the guy then fails. He's not even a descendant of King David through the father. Luke at least tries to say, well, through the mother. <laughs> no! <laughs> no! You failed. <laughs> you messed it up. But uh, A for effort, if you would just come out and confess it's not a real history, that you're actually talking about a future Messiah of the latter days for the three solar eclipses that are given as dates for the latter days in the, the stories of, of Samson in the book of Judges. And so, yeah, the death sign is Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 19, 11, and 17 specifically uh, as uh, the sun Amun is on Pegasus in the Pisces, the two loaves of fish, or the two fishes, and then the loaves of bread. Not a coincidence. They're given birth dates for us with the Jesus uh, and the uh, sacrament given with fishes and loaves of bread. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, the death date is there on 8 April 2024. As the solar eclipse, angel stands in the sun, who is on the back of Pegasus in Pisces, the constellation. That's the death sign. That's Samson dying in destroying the Philistines. He killed more in his death than in his life, as the author of that story does not seem to quite understand what it is that he's writing, even though he's given us the dates in the future for when they occur. And then uh, uh, the first solar eclipse, 21st of August 2017, it was in Leo, and then yes, in 2023, uh, whether it's the 14th or the 24th in October, uh, in, uh, in Virgo. And I, th I think close to the birthplace if I'm not mistaken. So, but uh, 
this, the whole Bible as my predecessors who are no longer available to uh, DM Murdoch is dead and Gary Greenberg is either too old or has finally died. He doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. He had come out with his book, made a lot of money off of it, and then Christians came out with a counter reply complaining about how he didn't reference anything and blah blah blah. It's not Christian and therefore it's heathen. <laughs> and then Christians cheered when DM Murdoch was died died from cancer on Christmas. 2015. Yeah, that's sure demonstrating Christ-like behavior, guys. Good job. So it's just me. And uh, uh, they didn't even know what I knew because they didn't decipher Paleo-Hebrew. And that led me to decipher Egyptian picture glyphs because in deciphering Paleo-Hebrew, I had to go identify the strokes of the, the linear script and Chinese helped me with that as uh, uh, there's uh, a book uh, published that gave the meanings of each of the strokes in Chinese in ancient form and uh, uh, confirmed uh, the Egyptian connection not just to Chinese but to Paleo-Hebrew and thus Paleo-Hebrew to Egyptian so the Semitic Hebrew that you've been taught is the ancient? No, it's wrong. So, alrighty, there you have it. And yeah, I'm not going to be able to do this video uh, until after I get back today. Uh, so, you'll just have to wait. I know there's just thousands upon tens of thousands upon hundreds of thousands of you thanks to YouTube lifting the analytical program restrictions on having my video made available for others to click on right but yeah the fact that I know this and Nelson has no clue and was using the white supremacist definition yeah the church ain't true guys It's the great and abominable church. So, there you go. I can't believe it was right here in front of me. <laughs> Alrighty. I think that's it. Yeah. I should have put in, uh, now that I'm doing this, I should have done the child for... Uh, Esau and Judith as well. I'll have to go back and see if I can find it. Uh, the uh, child of Judah and Tamar, uh, as uh, Judah wanted to have her burned, <laughs> and most likely that's where burning at the stake came from with uh, Spanish Inquisition and the witch's hammer. I hope not, but has to have an origin somewhere. Uh, they they had twins, and uh, uh, the birthright blessing son is Ferrets. It's the P, which in uh, Aramaic is the sign for a house. Uh, in Paleo Hebrew. It has the line above for heaven, and then the J stroke, which is for a man or a human a person. And so it's the person of heaven, which is not house, for example, is queen in Egyptian. So it's the same concept. Uh, Rets is the resh and the uh, tzade. Uh, using the Semitic versions of it, Rho, and uh, there is no equivalent in uh, Greek or Paleo Greek for the Sade. Uh, it's unique as uh, it's different than the Aramaic. Uh, so in Paleo Hebrew, 
it is the throne. So uh, that is the main thing. So king uh, versus kingdom. Uh, so you have uh, the king and then the resh before it, the god of the god king. Uh, thus indicating that Ferrets is born of Nut, uh, who represents the queen, uh, and he's the successor to the throne. It's that simple. Uh, it's similar to Eretz, as Eretz has the uh, uh, prefix determinative of the Aleph, or Alpha, uh, which is the Wajit I. So that's all part and parcel. The rising primordial mound, the birthright blessing sun, the Wajit I uh, as Horus in Egyptian, the son of Osiris who restored the kingdom uh, from his brother uh, King Set, Satan. Uh, the eyes personified him as the seer. Since I'm doing it, I don't know if I'll be able to uh, get this uploaded ever for you. This may just be a vlog, but let's find out. Oh, it only has and daughter of Hittite. It does not say that they had a son. Uh, Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Bari, the Hittite, and Bashemoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. So, two wives also, as Judah took two wives. So there's a, a pattern here. Uh, Could indicate that Esau became the the lineage of the Hittites is what they're trying to claim. But uh, there was Armageddon between the Hittite army and uh, King David Moses the Fourth, as I did that video on my older channel. So yeah, they don't say. If there's a 34, no, no, they don't link it properly. They just try to say, oh, interfaith marriages never work. Don't do it. Stay with Mormon. Stay with the Canaanite, Hittite, Philistine wives. <laughs> don't mess with the Egyptians. Alrighty, that's it. So I've gone through uh, the uh, video, as obviously, because I'm putting this at the end of it. And uh, and I've realized uh, there's a couple of things I need to add. The uh, first is to a passage that nobody else understands but me, because. I am the foremost expert on the subject matter. It's uh, from Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17. It says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. This is Balaam, uh, the son of Beor, as uh, he was uh, told... Uh, by Balak uh, yeah Balak is the one who is ordering Baalim to curse Israel and uh, Baalim is being told uh, you're actually supposed to bless them <laughs> and 
so Balak is a king wanting to destroy Israel and Baalam Baala Baalam is uh, instead saying Balak is not to be the king instead he continues on there shall come a star out of Yahab the usurper and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and nobody quite understands that but we get and shall smite the corners of Moab I'm sure that's that uh, place down in southern Utah right and destroy all the children of Seth wow well there's King Seth that I've already gone over with you Satan the one who murdered Osiris took over the throne and required Horus to restore the throne upon which all scripture is based upon and so what is this star out of Jacob nobody knows but me ta-da it's the star of David yay that was simple and easy wasn't it well again David is the promised king of kings, lord of lords, and uh, the 18th dynasty, of which needs to be restored in the latter days as the man like Moses, Moses uh, being of the 18th dynasty period of the David Moseses. So David and Moses are uh, syncretized, syncretized. However, that's supposed to be pronounced. It's where you merge two characters into one character, like Amun and Ra. Amun Ra. <clears throat> They're both talking about the same one. It's just merging over millennia of, of stuff. But, uh, uh, yeah, this is what this origin is all about for Mormonism and restoring the kingdom is about uh, uh, the uh, restoring of the kingdom of David from the Egyptians which refers to the original Horus Osiris set murderer situation and uh, all the stories from the Bible refer to that with variations differing uh, and so when the Book of Mormon tells us that the uh, plain and precious things have been taken out of the Bible and we were told that it's not translated correctly and Joseph constantly was working to get a revision not just the one that Sidney Rigdon did but uh, an actual perfected version to fulfill Ezekiel 37 as you'll notice David is in that passage also for the future and uh, yeah the prophets make a huge error in avoiding being translators by claiming that the Book of Mormon's already done the work for them so they don't have to be translators and fulfill Ezekiel 37 but that's what Joseph Smith and in the Book of Mormon it was saying is that it still needs to be done brass plates are it but the brass plates do not exist they have to be made that's the whole point with the Book of Mormon and saying hey guys we're giving you a message here uh, we're not talking about the Jesus of the Roman period we're talking about the future and the restoration of the kingdom that needed to be done before 2017 and uh, all about uh, the noonday sun that's the star the noonday sun you'll notice the ring around it that's the magan the shield of David uh, the, it's the sun symbol sun within a sun and yet also a solar eclipse in a sense for the latter day three days of darkness uh, 
not a coincidence that it's around noon time uh, when they begin or when they occur and uh, uh, referring to the collapse of the corrupt kingdoms and the advent of the restored kingdom for the millennial reign of peace and uh, uh, Amun is all a big part of that with David and Samson and <clears throat> and Nephi who gets authority from Jesus uh, so I just wanted to make sure that that was put in there but again if Mormons think that uh, they can just sit back and wait for it to happen and then they get the call oh there's Jesus at conference yay church is true Oh, okay, he's giving us commandments. Oh, we're supposed to practice polygamy. I have to give my wife away to some other guy. What? What? No way. You know, what are you expecting, Mormons? <laughs> Seriously. What are you expecting? Because we're not going to Adam on Diamond. The prophet's already designated Temple Square as Zion. So there it is. So if the church is true, then Jesus isn't going to Adam on Diamond. Even though the church owns the property, they haven't been building a conference center there. They built it here in Utah. And it's still too small. They can't have the whole priesthood in there. Unless they kill them off with, you know, section 45, verse 31, the desolating sickness. I wonder when we'll have that desolating sickness that is prophesied for the latter day time period between 2017 and 2024. I wonder, it will be a pandemic size sickness. I wonder if we'll ever get it. We were supposed to have Zion built so that it could be a place of peace, safety, and refuge from the sickness as well as the wars. What are you guys expecting? You guys, through your faithfulness, recognizing the church is false, need to understand so that you can leave it, destroy it, and find the guy prophesied in 103.16, a man like Moses, born of Mormons, fulfilling all the prophecies, so that you can restore the kingdom of David. But uh, yeah, the circle sun is a prefix determinative with David. Uh, Brown Driver and Briggs says it's a, a restoring prophet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. The restoring prophet of restoring prophets. Restoring the kingdom, restoring the kingdom of David. Kingdom of Ammon with the Ammon priesthood. And I've done the other videos. Amun uh, is the name of God for which Melchizedek was put in its place for the too frequent use of the word Amun. Uh, it's interesting that in Egyptian, Amun is the hidden one, the hidden name. And uh, the cow Hathor got drunk and uh, found out the, the name of, of Amun and uh, went on a killing spree as a result of her newfound powers of drunkenness. <laughs> Interesting story. Uh, there is a connection in the Bible uh, with uh, Noah getting drunk, but uh, I've already done that video. So, uh, it's 6.42 in the evening. Uh, I still have to save this video after uploading this portion. I, I don't need to add any more comments in there, I hope. But, uh, yeah, it's not going to be until tomorrow morning until I get this uploaded for you. But it will be saved tonight. I'll be sleeping 
thereafter. Alright.